This is a summary of The Economist's View of the World, a book by Stephen E. Rhodes. Professor Stephen E. Rhodes didn't start out as an economist, and that may be why, in 1985, he was able to write an economics book for non-economists that went on to become a bestseller. In this update, his now-classic text retains its readable style in presenting clear and thought-provoking examples of economic principles applied to real-life issues. Rhodes offers a full-throated endorsement of the role of economists in political decision-making, but his tone is neither partisan nor ideological, except in defense of free markets. Okay, let's hear the first takeaway. All economists appreciate the power and capability of markets. Economics contains many schools of thought and a range of opinions, but all economists tend to agree with philosopher Adam Smith's original message. Markets provide price signals and incentives that allocate scarce resources effectively. A brief study of the dense interconnections in trade can reveal just how much communication, calculation, and decision-making a well-functioning market can achieve automatically. This belief in markets underlies economists' reactions to certain controversies. For example, when people complain about the shrinking size of airline seats, economists tend to believe that as long as everything is transparent to the customer, a range of seat sizes can suit a range of preferences, thereby maximizing efficiency. Similarly, many people support rent controls, but nearly all economists know that the inevitable results of restricting market prices is rationing, waiting lists, and even bribes. Time for the second takeaway. Opportunity cost, marginal analysis, and cost-benefit analysis are the tools on which economists rely. Economists always see spending in one area as being an opportunity cost of not spending in another area, or in economics jargon, public welfare foregone. In contrast, The public's preferences and priorities can be inconsistent and dependent on how questions are framed. And politicians only care about political popularity. While people might highly value spending on, for example, police forces, economists distinguish between the intrinsic value of police spending as a whole and the marginal value of any extra spending on police above what is already allocated. The textbook example that illustrates this marginalist thinking is to consider the value of diamonds versus that of water. Someone who is thirsty and has no water at all would value the first glass of it more than diamonds, while the 100th gallon of water is worth little. Marginalist thinking describes the reality that the market price of something depends on its scarcity and utility at the margin and not on its intrinsic importance to people's lives. Economists would never say, too late to back out now, of a project that turned out to be uneconomical. Economists would not see the failing of a sector like the cotton industry in the United States as being due to poor investment. They would hold that the low investment value was a logical and appropriate response to competition from countries with lower costs. It's easy for non-economists to utter soundbites such as, human life is more important than profits. But economists have the sometimes controversial task of pointing out the compromises all people implicitly make or need others to make for them. If a person has multiple objectives, inevitably he or she must trade off among different goals. For a politician, understanding how to manage multiple objectives using marginalist reasoning is a basic competence that will maintain good services. Government shouldn't pinch pennies for some special projects, but a politician will not survive if there is a significant deterioration of basic public services or an excessive increase in taxes. Unfortunately, politicians, congressional staffs, and the Washington, D.C. media that hold them to account have an inadequate understanding of marginalist concepts, and government is the worse for it. Here's takeaway number three. Incentives drive markets and externalities suggest where regulation or government intervention is justified. Economists love markets and incentives drive markets, so economists love incentives too. Externalities is the economist's word for instances in which a mismatch in incentives occurs. 
in that the result of a market action, either good like technological change or bad like pollution, occurs despite the actor's intention. Externalities signal to an economist where a market may need special attention and possibly government intervention, such as by regulation, subsidy, tax, or provision. Clear-minded thinking about externalities can also expose insincere or misleading pleas for subsidies, clarify emotional policy decisions, and rationally structure debates about government spending. All right, let's hear takeaway four. Even when externalities exist, basic government inefficiencies argue against intervention. Economists instinctively believe that while individuals and businesses will act in their self-interests and use money carefully, governments and officials managing taxpayer money will generate a higher rate of waste and inefficiency. Incentives like electoral popularity and the risk of media exposure are not nearly as effective at promoting efficiency as the profit-seeking structures of commerce. Even left-of-center economists concede that efficiency rates in some areas of government are poor. Studies and examples repeatedly show that although subcontracting government services to the private sector is controversial, it often increases efficiency and reduces costs. Government sectors not disciplined by customer choice also can fall prey to incentives for policies that are not in the public's interest. For this reason, Most economists believe that not every instance of externality requires government intervention. Time for another takeaway. Economists can bring scientific rigor and proportion to many policy areas. Access to health care when a medical need arises is not an optional luxury, but a requirement. This suggests that if government provided health care services at low or no cost, demand would not go up. But economic studies show that increasing convenience and reducing costs significantly affects demand. When it comes to minor ailments, healthcare demand can be responsive to price. Similarly, medical professionals react to the resources they have at their disposal. Extra beds in hospitals are rarely left empty. An economist would argue that medical budgets should be spent in the areas in which they can do the most good, in terms of life expectancy and quality of life. Crucially, though, these areas may not be those a non-economist would target. When it comes to climate change, economists are overwhelmingly in favor of policies like carbon taxes rather than complex and legally costly command and control regulations. Economists favor incentives and market forces to achieve the maximum reduction in pollution with the minimum harm to the economy. Some environmentalists see such taxes as a license to pollute, but to an economist, this seems overly ideological. Economists also tend to support higher gasoline taxes rather than expensive efforts to prescribe fuel efficiency. History shows that profit and competitive pressures undermine expectations that companies will voluntarily reduce their pollution, so a tax or regulation of some kind is necessary. In regard to green policies, The economist looks to discern where the benefits exceed the costs and is critical of those who approach every question with ideological expressivism, being either for or against something based on predefined values. Flood defenses are an area in which economists see flawed policies based on passionate arguments. To help those affected by flooding seems admirable, but many U.S. policies encourage people, often those with above-average wealth, to maintain or build houses in areas likely to flood, with taxpayers in essence providing the flood insurance. Paying for properties to be abandoned can make economic sense. As with other government decisions, keeping them at the most local level results in a more accurate weighing of priorities and gets closer to recognizing the relevance of economists' opportunity costs and marginal analysis. Politicians are often seduced by the possibility of having a new bridge, road, or tunnel as part of their legacy, and engineers like being part of grand projects. Economists' role is to be more clear-eyed in deciding whether a project is actually a good use of taxpayers' money. In managing road or airport traffic, an economist might prefer some kind of congestion charge to keep customers away during peak times. 
Congestion charges tend to be unpopular, but once implemented, people see their benefits. Economists are wary of projects whose sole justification lies in boosting the economy. There are typically other, more direct ways to help economic growth. Politicians often see transport projects as a way to spread the wealth around the country, but economists observe that transport congestion tends to happen in busy, already prosperous urban areas. Trains and railroads attract high subsidies from governments, but economists are often skeptical. Investment tends to depend on the power of local politicians rather than genuine cost-effectiveness. In the less populated regions of the United States, massive distances and low demand make trains uneconomical. Arguments in favor of a subsidy, such as scenic routes or the needs of retirees, risk creating a middle-class transfer benefit. As with other big undertakings, studies of rail projects show that costs are systematically underestimated, while benefits and returns are overestimated. Funding for less glamorous buses often suffers when spending goes to trains, even though buses provide more cost-effective and greener solutions. We've now reached the sixth takeaway. Economists generally support free trade and are suspicious of protectionism and industrial policy. Politicians are regularly tempted to favor their local industries or workers, but economists see these actions as harming the common good that maximizes the advantages of trade and free markets. If every region pursued its own interests, the national economy would suffer. Industry policy and protectionism can lead to favors for political donors, to the government trying to prop up outmoded business models, or to officials trying to pick winners. Economists are more comfortable with open-ended policies, like enterprise zones, and funding for basic research. Rather than focusing on existing jobs, economists value productivity gains and growth, which imply change. And economists see the growing trend for licensing and credentials, especially in law and medicine, as a monopoly-like device to gain benefits for insiders at the cost to everyone else. Here's the next takeaway. Like the rest of society, economists are divided on questions of inequality and redistribution. When it comes to inequality and redistribution, economists are divided. Even the basic interpretation of how well or badly those with low incomes have fared is a point of debate as right-wingers claim that the improvement in goods and services available to low-income earners is undervalued. Even some left-of-center U.S. economists find fault with the labor market regulations of a country like France, which they argue increases unemployment. Clamping down on tax dodgers is a rare point of agreement. Most economists also concur that, in the long term, growth and productivity raise living standards not redistribution through methods such as taxation or unionization. And now for the eighth and final takeaway. Some economic schools go too far in transposing economic self-interest themes onto political questions. Through their education and interactions, economists develop a certain way of looking at the world and the public choice school applies this self-interest type of thinking to politics. But unlike economic markets, voting outcomes can underestimate the intensity of voters' desires. For example, if the majority of people mildly want something, while a minority are seriously against it, the solution needs political judgment, which might go against the majority's wishes. This relates to the age-old question of whether politicians should merely reflect the opinions of their voters or be elected on the basis of voters' trust that their candidates will make up their own minds as to what is right. Direct democracy is one solution to public choice beliefs that elected representatives tend to act in their own self-interest rather than the public's, but examples have shown that strong interest groups can influence the public, which is only partially interested and partially educated in some areas especially those involving technical economic issues. This is in contrast to politicians who rely on reasoning and debate to reach the right policies and, of course, 
have economists to advise them. That was a summary of The Economist's View of the World, a book by Stephen E. Rhodes. Here's a recap of the eight takeaways. Takeaway one, all economists appreciate the power and capability of markets. Takeaway two, opportunity cost marginal analysis and cost benefit analysis are the tools on which economists rely. Takeaway three, incentives drive markets and externalities suggest where regulation or government intervention is justified. The fourth takeaway, even when externalities exist, basic government inefficiencies argue against intervention. Takeaway five, economists can bring scientific rigor and proportion to many policy areas. Takeaway six, economists generally support free trade and are suspicious of protectionism and industrial policy. Takeaway seven, like the rest of society, economists are divided on questions of inequality and redistribution. And the final takeaway, some economic schools go too far in transposing economic self-interest themes onto political questions. You've been listening to a summary by Get Abstract. For more summaries on